Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that your word brings life. It brings justice. Thank you that your word is spoken, written, and most importantly, took on flesh. Thank you that your word is living and active. And thank you that everything in the Bible is your word. Father, as we read a strange part of the Bible, remind us of unstrange truths that last forever. Amen. Genesis 36, page 31. These are the family records of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanite women, Adar, daughter of Elon the Hittite, Aholabama, daughter of Anna, and granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basimath, daughter of Ishmael and sister of Nebaioth. Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau, Basimath bore Ruel, and Aholibama bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These were Esau's sons who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, sons, daughters, and all the people of his household, as well as the herds, all his livestock, and all the property he had acquired in Canaan. He went to a land away from his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too many for them to live together, and because of their herds, the land where they stayed could not support them. So Esau, that is Edom, lived in the mountains of Seir. These are the family records of Esau, father of the Edomites, in the mountains of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, son of Esau's wife, Ada, and Ruel, son of Esau's wife, Basimath. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah, a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz, bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Ada. These are Ruel's sons, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Basimath. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Aholabama, daughter of Anna and granddaughter of Zibion. She bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah to Edom. These are the chiefs of Esau's sons, the sons of Eliphaz, Esau's firstborn, chiefs Teman, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. These are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. These are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, chiefs Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the chiefs of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basimath. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Aholabama, chiefs Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs of Esau's wife, Aholabama, daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Esau, that is, Edom, and these are their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir the Horite, the inhabitants of that land. Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Hori and Heman. Timnah was Lotan's sister. These are Shobal's sons, Alvin, Manahath, Ebel, Shepho, and Onam. These are Zibion's sons, Ai and Anna. This was the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness while he was pasturing the donkeys of his father Zibion. These are the children of Anna, Dishon and Aholabama, daughter of Anna. These are Dishon's sons, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran and Cheran. These are Ezer's sons, Bilhan, Zarvan and Achan. These are Dishan's sons, Uz and Aran. These are the chiefs of the Horites, chiefs Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, according to their divisions in the land of Seir. These are the kings who ruled in the land of Edom before any king ruled over the Israelites. Bela, son of Beor, ruled in Edom. The name of his city was Dinhaba. When Bela died, Jobab, son of Zerah from Bozrah, ruled in his place. When Jobab died, Husham from the land of the Temanites ruled in his place. When Husham died, Hadad, son of Bedad, ruled in his place. He defeated Midian in the field of Moab. The name of his city was Avith. When Hadad died, Samla from Masrika ruled in his place. When Samla died, Shaul 
from Rehoboth on the river, ruled in his place. When Shaul died, Baal Hanan, son of Akbor, ruled in his place. When Baal Hanan, son of Akbor, died, Hadar ruled in his place. His city was Pau, and his wife's name was Mehetabel, daughter of Matred, daughter of Mizahab. These are the names of Esau's chiefs, according to their families and their localities by their names. Chiefs Timna, Alva, Jetheth, Aholabama, Ella, Pinon, Kenaz, Timan, Mibza, Magdiel, and Iram. These are Edom's chiefs, according to their settlements in the land they possessed. Esau was father of the Edomites. This is the word of the Lord. I think Steve and Dan breathed a sigh of relief when they looked at the preaching roster. Is that right? Uh, Why don't you open your newsletters and there's a sermon outline there. Uh, We're going to spend some time in God's word now. uh, And God willing, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. Uh, I love reading newspapers on the weekend, and uh, last weekend uh, I read an article out of the Australian Review section on a young man called Ned Brockman. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who Ned Brockman is, but he's a pretty impressive young man. He's a tradie from Forbes with a very luxurious mullet. He is 24, and he has just run one of the fastest times across Australia. 4,000 kilometres in just over 46 days. Uh, he, it's a really remarkable effort for a bloke who is on the record as saying, I hate running. I do it because it teaches me to do hard stuff. I think that's worth thinking about, isn't it? Uh, the impact on his body was immense. Uh, here's a, a, a gruesome alert. By the end of the run, there were maggots living in his toes. That's just hardcore, isn't it? And it took him months to straighten his arms because he ran like that for so many hours every day. Uh, In last Saturday's Australian, in the profile, he was asked a number of questions. Uh, The one thing I can't do without daily is, was one of the questions. Listen to his answer. I think being present every day, not looking forward or back, Just in the moment is a powerful skill. I try my best each day to be present as much as possible. That's a pretty good answer if you're trying to run 4,000 Ks, hey? I'm going to forget yesterday and I'm not even going to think about tomorrow. I'm just going to do today. But when you think about it, our world is actually fascinated by that philosophy, isn't it? And in our world, we actually take it to its logical conclusion. We're exhorted to live in the now. We're encouraged to live in the moment. And when it's taken to its logical conclusion in our world, that means that all that matters is what I feel, know, indulge in and experience now. Nothing else matters. Now, despite the fact that we think that's quite a modern philosophy... It's actually not a new way of life. If you go back to the third chapter of the Bible, it is there, living in the now. But Esau, Esau is the pin-up boy for that philosophy, that philosophy of living for the now. And today we're going to be encouraged to look at the legacy of that kind of life. Uh, We're in Genesis 36. Please make sure you have your Bibles open there. This is uh, the fifth year we've spent time in Genesis. We're doing it over eight years. Uh, At point two on the outline, you can see up here where we are in the book of the Bible or the storyline of the Bible. I know that's not great, and if you want a copy of this, I can email it to you. Uh, We are at the moment uh, up here in the green and the blue on the far end at the start. Genesis 1 and 2 describes how this world came to be. The world exists because of the word and will of God. God's purpose was to make image bearers who would live with him in his world, enjoying his presence, working and resting together under his word. Genesis 3 describes how the world was broken. Genesis 3 describes how Adam and Eve lived in the now. They doubted God's goodness. They decided to be God instead of God. The Bible calls that sin. I am in the middle. And God did exactly as he promised. God judged humans and that judgment 
is a broken world and death for all humanity. Genesis 4 to 11 describes the pattern of God dealing with that world now broken. And by the time we get to Genesis 12, 15 and 17, God expresses a formal commitment. He's always been committed, but a formal commitment to this world. He makes a covenant, a binding agreement with obligations with a bloke called Abraham. Nothing to recommend Abraham. At the moment, God made this agreement with him. Abraham was not even following God. (laughs) And God says, through Abraham's mob, I'm going to reverse the curse and I'm going to restore the world so that my mob will live with me in my place under my word. That's God's grace. God's undeserved kindness to a world and image bearers who had rejected him. And it is received by faith, trusting in what God promises and does and living like it. That covenant passes from Abraham to his son Isaac. Can anyone remember what Isaac means? What does that name mean? Laughter. That's right, because when did they have that little boy? Uh, When they were well advanced in years. Abraham was a 100 He is a reminder of God's grace that Abraham trusted in. That covenant then passed to Jacob, Isaac's son. And remember, that was a sign of God's grace. Remember Genesis 25? Isaac and Rebekah prayed for children. They conceived two boys and it was womb wars. Those two boys fought each other in the room. Rebekah cried out to God and said, what is going on, God? Be better off being dead. If you remember Genesis 25, God said, Two nations are in your womb, and the older will serve the younger. The promise will move to the younger. Two boys are born, Esau and Jacob, and their parents knew the commitment of God to work through Jacob, not Esau. Again, a sign of God's grace. They had their favourites. Isaac favoured Esau, who was a man of the outdoors. Rebecca favoured Jacob, who was smooth and grasping and a schemer. The parents took matters into their own hands, doubting God's word. Remember how dysfunctional... In fact, there's not really a functional family in God's word to this point, is there? That gives us great hope, doesn't it? They're all dysfunctional and the deception and hatred emerge. And you can see a summary of that in this picture. And again, I can give you a copy and I'll probably send these out in the catching up email tomorrow. And we're down now at the bottom of that. We're going to be talking about what happens to the next generation. We covered that last year and now we return. If you've got your Bibles there, look at the first verse. I'm at point three on the outline. First verse of Genesis 36. These are the family records of Esau, that is Edom. And there's this repeated formula. I'll give you the technical term so you'll win at trivia. It's called the Tuldot Formula. And it's used consistently right throughout Genesis to structure the account. And each time it's there, we get the family records of. Genesis 2 verse 4 is the first. Here are the family records of all of creation. And then it's given a number of times as we move to the next main character. Uh, But there are some characters, kind of like offshoots or tributaries. Uh, People who aren't in the main line of the story, but they're really important. And Ishmael, Abraham's first son, And Esau are two of them, and we're given their family histories. They're still significant. And God is interested in every image bearer. The interesting thing about both Ishmael and Esau is their family histories are given straight after their dad dies, before we then move back into the mainland. So who who is Esau? Who is Esau? We were reminded about him a, a little earlier. He was the firstborn of Isaac and Rebekah's twins. He was red, he was hairy, he was a hunter. Uh, he was an outdoors man. Uh, he grew the beard that I envy, a man of the fields and the range. He was a hunter and a soldier. He was Isaac's favourite. And listen to the assessment of him in the New Testament and see that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for one meal. For you know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance, so he sought it with tears. Uh, If you want to sum up Esau, he was a man of immense passion who lived now. 
immense passion who live now. At Genesis 25, 27 to 34, tells us the account this comes from. Jacob and Esau are out minding their father's flocks. If you'd like, they're on the travelling stock route. Things are grim. They're far away from home. Esau has been out hunting. Jacob is home cooking dinner. Esau is hungry. Esau smells and sees stew. Esau's tummy grumbles. Esau demands stew. I'll die if I don't eat. People say, I exaggerate. In fact, Esau is so caught up in the moment of now, the hunger, the grumbling tummy, that he turns his back on the grace of God for a bowl of lentils. You see, Esau didn't deserve his birthright, being born first. That was God's grace. And as he comes in, dominated by the now, this man of immense passion, he goes... I reject the grace for the bowl of stew. (laughs) I reject the eternal because of the immediacy of the now. Esau forgets yesterday, doesn't care about tomorrow. He lives now. That's the pattern for all of Esau's life. Uh, When Esau is 40, he decides to marry, Genesis 26, 34 to 35. He lives in the moment, he just grabs any girl. In fact, he doesn't just grab one, he grabs two. Esau is hungry, Esau grabs stew. Esau wants to marry, Esau grabs woman. When Esau is duped out of his inheritance in Genesis 27, when Rebekah and Jacob outmaneuver him and outscheme him and deceive the family, which was actually both sides scheming against the clear word of God, what what does Esau do? He flies into a rage. What's the solution? Murder. (laughs) That's the way to deal with your anger. When Esau finds out the situation, he gives what most of us give in the now, doesn't he? He doesn't give repentance. He gives sorrow. He doesn't turn around. He gives tears. That's the pattern of Esau's life. He lives now and rejects the eternal. Esau is hungry. Esau grabs stew. Esau is to wed. Esau grabs woman. Esau is angry. Esau wants to murder. Now, none of that should hide the reality of God's word either because Esau does grow up. His relationships mature and develop. And remember that family reunion in Genesis 33 that we saw last year? Uh, It's marvellous. Years of murderous intent have seeped away and Jacob walks over the hill and Esau just grabs him in the biggest hug. My brother! Bursts into tears. Come and have a beer, mate. Give me a kiss. Have a steak. Any paddock you want. It's so often the case, isn't it? You see, the people who live in the now, who dwell in the moment, who forget yesterday, who don't think about tomorrow, they're the good blokes, aren't they? They're the blokes you want to stand next to at the party. They're the guys you want to lean on the bar with. They're the guys you want to have a beer and a steak with because, gee, they tell a story, don't they? They're such good company. In a town like ours, they're the good blokes, aren't they? The guys who live in the now. But we've got to reckon with the legacy of living in the now, don't we? And I think that's the purpose of this list of names in Genesis 36. I'm at point three on the outline. The account of Esau's family is highly structured. If you've got it there on page 31, open and have a look. Verses 1 to 8 are a section, and then verses 9 to 43. Uh, if you look at verse 1, you'll see Esau, that is Edom. Then it's there in verse four, verse 8. Kind of like two bookends. This is a section. Uh, then when you go to verses 9 to 43, you have two bookends. Esau, father of the Edomites, verse 9. And then over in verse 43, Esau, father of the Edomites. Verses 1 to 8. Life in the land of Canaan. Verses 9 to 43, life as a nation. In that first section, keep your Bibles open. In that first section, verses 1 to 8, Esau lives in the now. And we see in two actions how he rejects the eternal. How he ignores yesterday and tomorrow. Uh, If you want, very simply, the legacy of Esau 
is living in the now and rejecting the eternal things of God. Living in the now, rejecting the eternal things of God. First, look there in verse 2, Esau took his wives from the Canaanite women. God's design for marriage in this family, which he was well aware of, which was to marry within God's mob, within people who took the things of God seriously. Esau says, not for me. I live in the now. I'll grab whichever woman I want. And we know when we go back to Genesis 26, the bitterness and grief that caused his family as they watched him turn his back on the eternal and live in his passion. Second, Esau rejected God's design for his people to live in the land. Look down there in verse 6. Wives, sons, daughters, people of household, herds, livestock, all the property he had acquired in Canaan. Notice all the economic terms. Notice how those terms are used again in verse 7. What does he do with all this? I want some elbow room. This land's too small for us. I can't make a living here. It's going to cramp my economy. So what does he do? He leaves the land. Uh, We know from Genesis 34 verse 21 that the land was big enough to support a number of nations. And Esau goes, it's not good for my finances. I I need to live in the now. Economic opportunity beckons. And so they leave and they go up to the land of Seir. So if you see there, that big yellow chunk down the bottom is where Edom moved. He had been living up just above that little red section. But he moved and he went up into the hill country. He built his capital in the city of Petra. It was impregnable. Huge numbers of caves right on top of a rocky mountain outcrop. And he lived in the now. In both of those instances, in verses 1 to 8, in terms of his decisions about marriage and his decisions about his economy, Esau said, I live in the now. And he rejected the eternal. And and really, when we go further in verses 9 through 43, it seems to have been a terrific success. A terrific success. And verses 9 to 14, 12 tribes emerge, just like the 12 tribes that will come from Jacob. Those 12 tribes, verses 15 to 19, give rise to a succession of chiefs. Those chiefs, verses 20 to 30, take over this land of Seir and the Horites. They do so well, verses 31 to 39, that before Israel has a chance, there are a series of kings. And verses 40 to 43, they have a set political structure of settlements, administration and rulers. He's making a go of life, this bloke, isn't he? Because living in the now, you're not going to miss the opportunity, are you? Don't think about yesterday, don't think about tomorrow, just live in the now. Look what's happened to Esau, he's given rise to Edom. A nation, kings emerge, take over territory, political structure created. No doubt that the promise of God is here. Remember Genesis 15 to 17, kings will come from you, Abraham. Here's a line of kings before, actually, if you pause and consider Esau's life, the line that lives in the now, in the present, in the moment, if you look at it carefully enough, you'll recognise the reality of sin. Uh, Let me just take you back. Listen to this little speech that might have taken place. All that abundance you had yesterday, forget that. All that abundance you can have tomorrow, forget that. That promise of God to deal with eating from that one tree, forget that. Today, right now, you just can't eat from that tree and you want to eat from that tree and I will eat from that tree because I'm God and God's not. Does that sound familiar? You see, I think you could make an argument to say that the philosophy of living in the now is the essence of sin, isn't it? Forget yesterday, forget tomorrow. I want it now and I am God and God is not. There is an alternative. (laughs) There is an alternative. It's hinted there in verse 31 if you've got your Bibles. You see, we've just looked at the line of Esau, but there's another line that's emerging there in verse 31, and whose line is that? It's the line of the Israelites. 
the family connected with Esau's brother, Jacob. The line we're told in Genesis 37, verse 1. Sorry, Dan, I'm stealing it. In Genesis 37, verse 1, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. That's the line that lives for eternity today. You see, the line of Jacob, the line of Israel, stays within the promises of God. I'm at the next point on the outline. Now, you don't want to airbrush reality. Jacob, he's a mongrel. He's a deceiver. He's dysfunctional. He grasps, he schemes, he manipulates. But there are two lines here, the line of Jacob and the line of Esau, and you are meant to see the contrast, and the contrast brings conflict. Life in the now or life now because of eternity. You then see it right through the whole Bible. In Numbers 20, 14 to 21, God's people come out of Egypt and they ask permission to go home to Canaan and they've got to go through the land of Edom. And what does Edom say? Not on your nelly. And then the first king of God's people comes about the same time as the line of kings runs out in Edom. In 1 Samuel 14, 47, that first king comes. Saul, and what, what's one of the first things he does? Has a war with Edom. And wins. Uh, Obadiah 14, as we move into the prophets, God's mob are taken into exile because they have decided to live in the now and not in the eternal. And who's there cheering on the sideline and feasting on the scraps? Edom, because they live in the present. And, And that conflict between those two lines, the line of Esau and the line of Jacob, living in the now and living now in light of eternity, goes right through to Matthew 2. That's why Max read it. Who's born there? That's the last descendant of Jacob. Jesus Christ. And he's born because of God's promises in the eternal. He's born into Abraham's mob for the world. He's God's promise to work eternally now. And who's the king at that time in Matthew 2? What's well, King Herod? Do you, do you know where Herod was from? Herod is from the family line of Esau. He's an Idumean, an Edomite. And just like Esau, he lives for the now. The birth of Jesus disturbs him. He's then outwitted by the wise men. And when he is outwitted by the wise men, what does he do? He flies into a rage. Is that familiar? And when he flies into a rage, what does he do? He kills people. Does that sound familiar? Right there to the birth of Jesus. But Jesus is not killed. And Jesus lives on in light of eternity. Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. John 6, 38, I've come to do the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 26, 42, Father, please take this cup from me, but if it is your will, no matter the cost, let it happen. You see, Jesus isn't in the line of Esau, is he? He's in the line of Jacob. Jesus doesn't live for the now. He lives now for eternity. And whilst the legacy of living in the now looks shiny and bright and life in the now because of eternity looks unsuccessful and strange, which one do we remember? Do we celebrate Edom's birthday every year? And those who follow Jesus are just like him. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If we follow Jesus, then we live now in light of when? In light of eternity. So let me finish with one observation and two questions. Observation. Throughout this account, who always keeps his promises? God does. God keeps his eternal promises in the now. And that leads to two questions. The first is foundation. Which line are you in? Which line are you in? Are you in Esau's line that lives for the now? Or are you in Jacob's line that lives now because of eternity? Second question, and it has a, is a consequence of the first. If you are a follower of Jesus in the line of Jacob, 
Do you actually live in light of eternity? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. It's a strange one today. But, Father, as we dive into it, we see why it is your word and it is remarkably clear. Father, we do thank you for Esau. We do thank you that you gave him life. We do give you thanks that by the time Revelation 7 comes, uh, there are members of Esau's family in your kingdom. Father, please protect us from living in the now and forsaking eternity. Thank you for the line of Jacob that culminates in Jesus. Father, thank you that you keep your promises. Please bring us into eternity now and help us to live like it. Amen.